All right, extinction. Is it a natural thing? Should species go extinct? Yes. Yes, they do. They should. They have, actually. And as is mentioned there, almost uh, most of the organisms that have lived on Earth are no longer here. They have gone extinct. Okay. So this, this presents a little bit of a problem in defining um, whether or not something is going extinct because it's supposed to go extinct, or you know, its time is up, supposed, so to speak, or is it um, something that we're causing to go extinct? So um, you have a no. Was nah. Nah. Hello, eraser. Okay, it's just gone down. So we have a natural, not a natural, but a background rate of extinction. Uh, no, no, no. And when we talk about background, that's something that's there already. What are the other places that uh, we mentioned background, ex background uh, variable was uh, radiation? There's a certain amount of radiation that you naturally are exposed to every day, whether it's from the sun, radon, etc. Uh, radioactive materials in the mantle of the earth besides radon. The, that is what's called background radiation. And so you also have what's known as a background Rate of extinction. Okay, so that is um, going to be something that happens normally. It's hard to determine. Like I said, it's hard to determine which is what in many cases, in many situations. So we have to look at the anthropogenic impact and what uh, part or what role that is playing in the population numbers of this organism going down. So once that is done, we can establish what things are are being uh, driven to extinction, so to speak. Uh, by things that we do, okay? So that's, what, that's when we label them as being endangered species. All right, so um, the most common way we think of extinctions is the permanent kind, the kind where uh, there's none left on Earth. Now this is something also that, depending upon the organism, can be kind of hard to determine. It's very hard to get a count on a lot of different organisms, and there are organisms that we think have gone extinct, but we were wrong. Anybody know the uh, most, probably most popular, common example of something we thought was extinct, but then they found one, and now we know that they're uh, they're there still, that they have uh, breeding populations still endangered, but that are there around there. And you know, anybody know what uh, particular organism? And it's an interesting one because it has a as a as a good transitional organism we've seen between species. That we know, or even the group of organisms that it's in. Is it a plant, animal, or, well, yeah, it's an animal, I'll tell you that. Any ideas? Nobody? Is it here in Florida? Uh, no, actually, they found it off the coast of South Africa. So that gives you a hint. It's off the coast. Huh? Sorry, that was not the right answer. Yeah. Uh, uh, dinosaurs are extinct. I'm pretty sure they haven't found another one. Um, how about the coelacanth? Does anybody know what the coelacanth is? The what? Is it a fish. Yeah, it's a fish. It's actually called a low fin fish. Particularly those of you who have biology with uh, Mr. Campbell should know that it represents a kind of a transition because the fins are actually have uh, appendages, bones in them, kind of like they're becoming. Um, uh, legs and stuff. Alright, well that's a different story, but the point being is uh, they thought it was extinct uh, for a long time. They have fossil record of it and then uh, I believe it was around the 1920s or something, a fishing vessel just happened with, with a net uh, pulled in uh, one of these and the guy's looking like, oh, that's weird, I've never seen a fish like that before. And they sent it to a museum, etc. And uh, now we have the coelacanth, which um, does exist and uh, is not actually extinct. So it's kind of hard to tell sometimes but uh, biological extinction is most commonly uh, thought of extinction where that particular organism is gone from Earth altogether. Uh, there are other types of extinctions, though. Um, local extinctions within an ecosystem. This is when a population in a particular ecosystem's numbers are getting down to the point where it may no longer exist in that ecosystem. So 
Um, that, and that's a bad thing. You know, we can't just keep, we can't move organisms around all the time and, and take some out of here and put them in there. We've done that, and sometimes it does have good results, like uh, putting it wolves back into Yellowstone. But um, you know, in general, trying to change things uh, to to fix what we've done is not always the, the best way of doing things. So you have those type of things, local extinctions, um, that are of course more common as well. Um, so that's a particular population in an ecosystem. And then you also have some other ones like genetic extinction. And um, that means that there are still surviving organisms, but their uh, numbers have gotten so low that their gene pool is so small and limited and lacking in diversity that they're very prone to diseases and other types of things. And in general, uh, biologists believe that, uh, and genetic biologists believe that this, this species on its own with no in impact from people does not have enough organisms in it to, to produce a, a viable population. That's going to go extinct anyway, even if you do everything you can to save it. And even if they're reproducing, you've got breeding pairs, they're still, the, the, they're so genetically weak that they're not, just not going to make it. Um, the uh, cheetah is believed to be in this particular category. And the California condor is also in this, this area there. Um, and so those are some examples of what uh, genetic extinction is. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave off commercial extinction because that's kind of something we talked about back in, in fishing. I remember. Um, so the, uh, what makes a species particularly vulnerable to extinction? As you might imagine, a few things like slow reproductive rates. Obviously, if it takes a long time for it to reproduce, we see this, of course, with a lot of top-level predators because we know that those, they have to keep their numbers small at the top of the ecological pyramid. Um, tigers, for example, the reproduce uh, like every two to three years. You know, so they, that's obviously when you, those numbers go down, it's going to have a slow um, rebound if you, if you can bring it back. Uh, limited uh, tolerance ranges, that's good. That is actually one thing, uh, although that's such a, that's a broad one, so that's not really what I was going for there, but I will give you the point for that group three. It's a good answer and uh, correct as well. Uh, geographic range. So, and that, all, and that actually also often ref is related to tolerance ranges because there's only certain parts of the world where the conditions are right for this organism. But if they're only naturally found in very small, very limited areas around the world, then um, they're going to be more uh, 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 liable to go extinct. You know, you're not going to be able to replenish their stocks from other places as well. Uh, top of the food chain, top of the food chain to you. Um, that, of course, is going to, there's, there's fewer of them, they get more Im impact from toxins. They also, a lot of the, your top level predators need a very broad uh, 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 range to, to get all their food from. They need large, open, wide open spaces, and uh, we tend to do things to limit that, and therefore they become very uh, susceptible to, to becoming extinct because of that as well. Um, and then finally, if they have limited genetic diversity, this goes back to our genetic extinction. So if you've got a population that uh, either because of its low numbers or just uh, certain random, you know, there's a lot of randomness to genetics, the way things come together, things called genetic drift and things that they just happen to end up with a limited gene pool, um, they're not going to do very, very well and be more likely to go extinct. Uh, another area that is of uh, a lot of concern to um, you know, population biologists and, and conservations and everything are island species. And we don't really th see this or think about this that much, uh, probably, because we don't live on an island. But um, in many parts of the world, both in the Pacific and in the Caribbean, there's a lot of species, a lot of endangered species. There's a much higher rate of endangered species in those uh, particular areas uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, some of them are kind of obvious in the fact that they're going to have a, a low, a small geographic range. It's got a lot, not going to be a lot of places they can escape to, to uh, reduce pressures on them, to find new food sources and things like that. Um, because islands have a limited number of geographic, of uh, environmental uh, conditions, then these uh, organisms oftentimes will be very sp in specific niches, have specific things that they eat. We talked about this with different types of specialists versus generalist uh, organisms. So a specialist is organisms that type of specific niches. Uh, top of the food chain already. I, did I put that twice? 
No, I just mentioned it before, but that's that's going to be one that that included as well. So that one not so much. Let me say that you, know, you can have the top level predators anywhere. So that's that's not uh, specific for island populations, but also with island populations, you've got storms, uh, tsunamis, and things like that that uh, tend to have much greater impact, of course, on an island, um, and also. Um, because of the limited, you know, their inability of the organisms to escape and go to a place of safety or a place where the, the change has not occurred that much, then they're more, going to be more vulnerable as well. So it's kind of, I think it's kind of obvious to, to assume that, that islands, ecosystems in general are, are more fragile. Um, and we've seen a lot of um, <coughs> endangerment as well as premature extinctions go on in those particular areas. Um, now, preserving biodiversity, that's what this is all about. Uh, the more organisms you have, the fewer number of, of uh, populations of uh, species that go extinct, um, the greater the biodiversity will be. That's what we call perverse, preserving uh, biodiversity. And you have a um, species-based approach, which is kind of the way it's been looked at a lot in the past. And this involves determining species that are endangered, uh, doing uh, things like the Endangered Species Act, which means uh, if this species is present in a particular area, you can't develop that land, uh, you can't possess these species, you certainly can't kill them, uh, you can't transport them around. Um, and so a number of, of regulations and stuff that's involved with uh, protecting specific species that we have, we have determined are endangered. And then you have um, the ecosystem approach, which is becoming more favorable and more, they're realizing more and more that this is really the way to go, um, but it's not always a practical thing to do because it's going to mean simply saying we're going to preserve land. We're going to take this land and we're not, uh, not going to develop it. And in some cases, well, you might reclaim it. You might say, all right, this is kind of like a, a bad roadway or something like that. We're going to reroute it. We're just going to uh, tear it up, reroute it around so it's not going through a, a biological hot spot, which we'll talk about what those are later, but uh, going through as a, a sensitive an area and uh, trying to preserve the habitat that those endangered species are in. Um, and there is also the flip side of this also is if you, you know, kind of like take your eye off the ball a little bit, you may end up, if you're not fully vested in, in just preserving the species that, that are endangered, some of them may go by the wayside. Like the cheetah, there may be nothing we can do about it. You guys, uh, hopefully not, but you, you may send, see the end of wild populations of cheetahs, cheetahs in your lifetime. Um, there's... You, if in the case of uh, ecosystem-based approach, you'd say we'll just do what we can to preserve that cheetah's habitat. If they go extinct, that's unfortunately the way it is. So you can see how it can be hard decisions there. But in general, the the ecosystem approach is the best because that's going to preserve habitat. That's going to reduce other species from going extinct as much, and therefore um, it is it is an ideal thing to do. Any questions about different types of extinction? Um, and some of the things that make a, a species particularly um, su uh, susceptible, vulnerable to extinction. Alrighty. So most of the time when people think of extinction, you think of uh, animals being hunted to death. And there's been certainly a lot of cases that have uh, popularized that. Um, the passenger pigeon used to be the most numerous bird in North America and they were hunted to extinction. The dodo bird we just just uh, uh, mentioned. So apparently, birds are particularly susceptible to this. Um, when it comes to you know, we, of course, hunting and fishing could be in that same category. There's a lot of commercial uh, uh, species that have been harvested to the point of at least commercial extinction, and, and are getting some may get close to the otherwise. But in general, um, that's rarely the cause of, or that is not the main cause of um, uh, habitats going pre or species going prematurely extinct. Main thing is habitat alteration, which is most commonly referred to as habitat destruction, but this is a more uh, uh, um, correct phrase and it's one that is used in informed circles more so. Um, but um, this, is, uh, this has a, a double effect, by the way. Of course, uh, everything, organisms need the things that are in their habitat. We talked on and on about how it starts at the base with your, your physical, the water and the soil and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so organisms need that, of course, 
Um, but the second thing that happens, now the plants are just gone when you go in, let's say, clear out an area of the rainforest. But um, the animals, you know, a lot of them are going to move. But the problem is, is that when they move, they're going into areas, you remember from population growth, where most of the species in that particular ecosystem that they move into are already at carrying capacity. They have already maximized their use of the resources there. So when you crowd it up with a bunch more numbers uh, in their population and all the competition, all that kind of stuff, you not only have had loss from the area that was cleared, you're going to impact um, significantly the areas in which those uh, uh, animals and other things that can move, that area in which they move into. Okay, So that's a double thing, and that's why it has uh, habitat alteration has such a, a dramatic impact on um, the populations and species in, in general that are in those areas. Okay, So um, since that's the number one cause for this happening, uh, the number one way to reduce that is by forming preserves. Okay, And we're not talking about strawberry preserves or some fruity type jam concoction. Uh, these are areas that you set aside and um, ideally, you say no use, no human impact whatsoever. Now, of course, you can't get that completely because you still have air and water pollution that can be transported in there no matter how tall you build the fences and stuff. But um, this would mean, you know, people are not allowed to, to hike through there, for example. People are not allowed to hunt or fish through there. So what we see is that around the, the world with these different types of preserves and these different areas that are set aside for the sake of nature, is that they oftentimes have varying levels of, um, of restrictions that are put on them. And I've even mentioned how you have the Seminole State Forest over here, which is it's a managed area, but they, so they allow logging in there and everything as long as you follow certain rules and those type of things. Um, so from a strictly environmental perspective, yes, it would be best if we could set aside areas and say don't do anything with it. But as I mentioned before, that's not often very practical to do. Um, so we establish these different preserves, conservation areas, uh, state forests, state parks. There's, there's dozens of different designations and they vary from country to country so um, that, that indicate to what level people can use those particular areas. And you have to also remember that if you were to take, for example, state parks and say, all right, we're really going to go completely environmental, we're going to say nobody can use these state parks at all. That would be the best, you know, people going even hiking around and stuff has its, it has its impact on the environment. But how much support do you think those state parts would get from the public then? How much support would you think you would get from these different areas? Zero. Not, yeah, very little. You know, and I would say zero because, you know, you have some people that are going to say, well, we need to do it this way. But you're, you've got to have some type of public interest, recreational interest, or whatever it is, in order for people to appreciate and want to have it. Uh, this is one of the arguments, by the way, also for zoos. Um, when you have animals, you might say, oh, those animals should be out in the wild. But let me, I'll tell you what, first of all, they like being in a zoo, just like we like to live in houses and go to jobs so we can buy stuff at the grocery store rather than having to hunt for everything and, and gather everything from the ground. We made that choice for the most part, unless it's a terrible zoo, but a modern uh, zoo that is well maintained and everything, those animals there actually, they've got it pretty good, you know. They, yeah, they do. They, they get all the meals for them. They're actually even encouraged to mate with the, you know, they don't have to fight to mate with something, you know, they're in, et cetera. So they're living pretty good there. Um, but point being is that uh, zoos expose people to the, the animals to the, and, and uh, makes people more aware of, uh, you know, things that need to be uh, preserved in conservation, those kind of things. So it's, it's been shown that they increase contributions and things to uh, these different organizations. Speaking of which, um, these preserve areas may be things that governments establish. That's usually the, the, the way it's done. It's through governments. But um, also there's a number of private organizations that uh, are in the business of doing this. Usually when the private organizations do it, then they will go, all right, this is set aside. Nobody can do anything at all with it. Uh, one particular organization, or the probably the, the biggest organization that does this, is the Nature Conservancy. And uh, if I may uh, give advice, if you are looking, you know, charitable-wise or even uh, time volunteering-wise to um, work with a, an environmental preservation organization, the Nature Conservancy, I think, is one of the most effective because rather than running boats in front of whaling ships and tying themselves to tractors and stuff like that, um, they just collect funds and buy properties, buy areas where 
uh, there is a concern for what someone would call hot spots, where there's a concern that, that uh, these areas are likely to be developed or they have a lot of endangered species or whatever else. That's, their, that's what they do. You know, so you won't really see them in the news and stuff because they don't waste a lot of time in court and doing dramatic things. They're not going to make a reality show about them. Um, but they um, are very effective at what they do. So um, one of the things that when you do preservations, one of the things that you have to uh, try to try to do, as I've just said, you can have some development, but you want to limit as much something called fragmentation. Because there's a temptation to say, okay, let's build a road through this forest, for example. Um, you've got a couple cities on each side, uh, a road through a thousand acres of, of forest is going to take up less than a percent probably of the actual land in that forest. Okay, But what happens is that it splits that forest, it may, basically goes from one ecosystem to two ecosystems. It, ba it makes an island out of it, just like we, and the, the problems we saw with the islands, the, the actual islands that are in the ocean kind of thing. Um, it causes a lot of the problems there because that road is, is a barrier. So it isolates them and it changes the, the geometry of it, actually. And that just, as you can imagine, you can, it's like a pizza, you cut it down the middle, now you have, and split it apart, now you have two half pizzas, of course, but you have actually a lot more edge than you had before, okay? Um, in ecosystems, that edge habitat is different from the core habitat and so you have less of that core habitat maybe not a lot less but you still have less of that core habitat and you have much more edge habitat okay so this is a disruption of the normal ecological balance and has been shown to be quite long reaching in in its effects so if you talk about like I said maybe taking up about one percent of the land uh, it can have the impact equivalent of just chopping out a quarter of that to total ecosystem just from what it does. Uh, some of the things that in particular um, are affected, sorry group two, we got to go the exact opposite direction here, are animals that have to range over long distances. This is typically um, top level consumers are, are a prime example of that. Uh, because of the fact that they have a, at the top of the ecological pyramid, they have a limited food supply, so they have to cover large distances to get their food. Okay, so that means if you take that thousand acres, they may use 500 of those acres. A single tiger, for example, may go across that whole area uh, in a week just to find its its an prey to feed it. And so consequently, you put that barrier up there, you've really cut its food supply almost in half. Uh, then of course, if it's a road, what also do you think is gonna have a big impact on these the predators? But what, what, what do you think will be killing? For example, this is the main thing that killed Florida car. Panthers. Car yeah, car impact, absolutely. Get hit by cars. So that's a problem. Are you saying okay. Panthers? No, Panthers, Florida Panthers, yeah. Yes. I mean, they could have. They could have been. They're pretty slow, so I can. I imagine you see them a little bit better, but uh, exactly. so anyway, top-level consumers, top-level predators are particularly affected by fragmentation. Okay. Um, also, well, one uh, potential help to this, one thing that works somewhat, are things called wilderness corridors. And as a matter of fact, we've got one pretty close to here. Anybody know what I'm talking about, Tyler? Do you know? You looking it up? Get off your phone, please. Um, you guys shouldn't even have my address. I want you to clear out. We're gonna we're gonna be much more strict on that through the. This is boot camp, by the way, because we're heading for review. So, um, the um, anybody ever be go west on 46 uh, from Sanford to Mount Dora? Yeah, yeah. Anybody drive that? Yeah. You notice how as you drive along, all of a sudden there'll be those big tall fences yeah. Yeah. on the side, and then there'll be a little break, you go a little hump, and then the fences come back. You know what that is? Yeah. Uh, you might, uh, you just said. So, well, more than that than what I just said, uh, what is, yeah, Lauren, it's a wilderness corridor, sure, yeah. A tunnel that goes over the highway? Not over. Or uh, under it. Yeah, tunnel under the highway, correct. For what? For bears. Primarily bears. Now, bears actually made enough of a comeback that they're 
kind of becoming a problem. They just recently, this was the first year they had a bear hunt. But uh, when that was built, they, you know, they, they're still, th uh, I, well, I don't, know. I don't know if they're considered threatened now. If you have hunts for threatened animals, I don't have to check into that. But they were threatened at one point, threatened population, the Florida black bear. And that is the prime habitat for that, that, uh, that organism. And one of the main things that was killing it was crossing Highway 46. It's a long two-lane road, and the people are going 55. And so that was a common way in which those the, the bears were killed. So what that is, it's, it is a tunnel. And now the fences are there, so it doesn't they don't go across the road, and they eventually get to the point where there's that tunnel underground. They can cross under that tunnel and uh, make it to you know to the other side. You know, because the bear went the bear. So the, instead of going over the mountain, the bear went under the road. Yeah. yeah, Caroline. Is it true that in Germany they have kind of like those, but they're Passover and it's like made of grass? Thank you, Caroline, for pointing that out. I was just going to mention that. Yes. They what they have found, they, and it's not just Germany, but they have a, one of the, the directions they're going more so with this now is rather than, than tunnels under the road making basically an overpass where the cars go in a tunnel, tunnel, <laughs> under, you know, it's a, it's a land bridge basically. And so on that, that bridge that's over the road is woods and, and trees and grass and everything else like that. So to uh, the bear, whatever's being protected, it's more or less, you know, they don't know the difference. It's kind of hard to get a bear through the tunnels, especially the big ones, you got to get behind them and push them through, you know, and everything. But, <laughs> no, they're bigger than that. But it, it's still, it's, it's not a natural structure for them, so it does take a little while before they get used to using it. So that limits it a little bit, but these the overpass corridor overpasses really wilderness. Cool oh yeah, overpasses are actually um, a more effective way uh, to do that. So <clears throat> those help, but you know you're still going to get bears. You still get bears get hit by cars and stuff because they don't use it or they get on before the fence goes up and whatever else. And so complete preservation is ideal in that respect. Um, there are areas so we can, we're clear on fragmentation, right? Anybody have any questions about it? Okay. So ecologists have established around the world certain areas where uh, both the biodiversity is high and uh, species, there's a large number of species in the, those areas that are particularly under threat. From what, what well, whatever, from development, threat from uh, climate change, like islands, threat from uh, pollution. So these areas, uh, like I said, they've been established. They are called biodiversity hotspots, and they just give ecologists, conservation biologists, um, areas to focus on and, and, and devote their efforts. Of course, these will be, like I said, the Nature Conservancy goes around buying things. They will, in particular, buy plots of land and stuff in these areas. And so that's what a biodiversity hotspot is. And I'll show you a map in a second, which you just saw actually, because I bumped the mouse, that shows you some of those. Any questions? So second to habitat alteration, as far as impact on native species, is invasive species um, that are Technically exotic. So let me let me make a little clarification here. Um, you can put this in the side if you want. So exotic equals non-native. All right. So just because an organism is not normally in an ecosystem uh, does not make it an invasive species. Okay, that organism has to have shown impact from doing so. Am I lined up all right? I got you. I got you. Okay, so um, they are they are considered to be the second most common cause of uh, premature extinction. The impact that they have, um, they, um, in order, like I said, in order to be called invasive, they have to have been shown to have affected the natural populations of an ecosystem. Um, and otherwise, they're just exotic. So sometimes you see the term exotic invasive species, but whatever. I just go with simply invasive species. Um, they uh, most commonly the most common thing that they do is outcompete, uh, particularly when it comes to plants, uh, because of course that's what plants do. Is they you know they're not out eating other plants for the most part, but.
but they are uh, competing with other plants uh, for ground space, for sunlight, um, nutrients, etc. So uh, this is actually um, the most impact has been seen with, with invasive plants. Uh, you do, of course, get some good old-fashioned predation. Uh, and disease. And the disease one also is one that we've seen quite a bit of with trees. And that's been a problem with a number of, a number of those. Uh, the um, chestnut. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Anybody ever seen chestnuts? Mm -hmm. you seen them? No, yeah. because the chestnut tree is practically extinct. Uh, it was very common 100, 150 years ago. But then the uh, Dutch, or the uh, chestnut blight, they call it. I think it's a type of fungus, I'm not positive. But uh, anyway, it was introduced, and at least in, in the United States and then North America, um, the numbers are, it's practically extinct. I, should, I, I think they do have domestic specimens that they've been able to preserve and stuff, but out in the wild, uh, you, it's almost impossible to find them. So it's considered to be extinct. Um, and that, of course, with plants is another thing. If you've got one tree here and one uh, uh, a thousand miles away, the practicality of that, that there being any recovery there is, is pretty much none, so it's considered to be extinct in those particular states that they're in. Um, the, uh, a big way to reduce uh, invasive species, as you might <laughs> imagine, is uh, regulation of trade. So this could come in the form of simply um, better inspection, but also comes in the form of, um, of regulations. For example, if you, have, if you know that you have an exotic species, <clears throat> then you're not allowed to transport it, um, an invasive species, excuse me. So you could actually get fines and everything for moving it from one place to another, <coughs> intentional or not. Uh, there was a while, one, of, one uh, particular troublesome organism is, is hydrilla. It's, a, it's an aquatic plant. Aquatic weeds have, have caused a number of problems. <clears throat> excuse me, particularly in Florida waterways, and uh, wasn't uncommon for people to go out their boats and, and drive around and stuff and uh, come back in and have these these hydrilla weeds caught in their propellers and things and then <clears throat> drive off somewhere else. Uh, but technically, although I'm not sure it was much enforced because most of the time people wouldn't know, but technically if, if the, if the uh, uh, EPA <clears throat> saw you doing that, they could fine you for transporting this invasive species from one place to another, even though it wasn't intentional. So um, that's a big uh, area in which uh, you can um, regulate and transportation, transport containers. As I just mentioned, transportation in general is, is illegal of, a, of an invasive species. Um, but many of the tree diseases that have uh, affected um, trees around the world have come from, and by the way, a disease in a tree can also mean insect infestation, so it doesn't have to be a disease like we usually think of. But um, we, of course, worldwide shipping is a huge thing now. This, of course, is a, the source of much, much of this. Uh, and as you might imagine, the internet has caused even more of this because a lot more people shop online and having, having their things delivered from you know, other places around the world, etc. Uh, point is, is that a lot of these things are, are shipped with pallets. You guys know what pallets are, right? Yep. It's just, yeah, there's just a wooden structures. Nice looking wood they use on those, right? No, it's, it's terrible. So it's like the waste wood. It's something you couldn't use for something else, but they build these wooden structures, pallets, uh, that forklifts can get underneath and lift it and move it around, and that's the way most things are shipped around the world. Well, there's not a lot of regulation in that, and both the pallets and as well as uh, sometimes if it's a you know, particularly bulky item, they'll have wooden crates that they're, they're transporting them in. Um, when they get to their place that they're going, their destination, they will oftentimes just take those ships, those crates and everything, and, and throw them out, dispose them, put them in a landfill or whatever else, or they'll have them out back or, or, or whatever kind of things. Well, they're wood, so they're made from trees, and uh, they're typically made from trees that are in their point of origin, let's say Asia, for example. And therefore, those trees, there's a good chance that those trees might have been infested with some kind of bug or uh, a mold or something like that. And then when they get here, that, that insect or whatever the problem is gets out and it doesn't have the same kind of competition or the native trees are not as resistant to it 
as the uh, as the foreign trees, and therefore you've got you've got uh, diseases and trees that spread out. So it's a very common way in which um, these um, uh, exotic in, invasive uh, tree diseases are, are transported around. So it's a lot of call to have more regulation of that. Have the, you know have once they get there, have something done where they're burnt or something like that to keep them from getting out into the environment. Um, the catch-all category, you can look at all the different types of anthropogenic impact that we have and assume that that's going to cause uh, stress and going to cause uh, premature extinction for some uh, number of different species. So pollution, of course, climate change, um, over-harvesting, particularly with fish. This has been the biggest impact area with marine fish populations, of course, of people still get most of their fish, the fish that we eat, from the sea. Um, and therefore, if you harvest too many of them, get too many of them over hunting, hunting is going to be on, in that particular area as well. And particularly if it is poaching, and that's illegal hunting or uh, fishing or any kind of illegal taking of uh, organisms in the wild. Okay, so you probably, these are the ones you hear about a lot, although they're not, like I said, they're not the main cause for um, premature extinction, but like people hunting rhinos for their horn and things like that. Um, so uh, you can regulate that a lot of times, and as I mentioned, properly managed hunting and fishing can actually uh, play a role. This is what I see when I said, "Oh, well, now they're allowing uh, bears to be hunted." That's not done so we can say, "All right, hunters, we're going to cut you some slack. We like you, hunters. We like you to be, to be able to do that." That is actually an ecological uh, thing that is done because they become overpopulated, um, and there wouldn't be overpopulated, keep in mind, if they had more room to spread out. But they don't because of the number one cause. What's happened? Uh, Habitat alteration. So instead of having woods and stuff along the Kyber River Basin that the black deer bear can hang out in, there are housing developments. Stuff that works out. <laughs> um, so consequently, um, that's you know that's why it all ties back to that habitat alteration, habitat destruction kind of thing. Um, the uh, so that can help that as well. Um, nobody got this. So what's the word here? A limit of trade of something from an exotic from a species. Oh, this is in the class of the girls with the elephant things. Huh. The ivory. Thank you. Yeah, ivory. Uh, I just mentioned rhinoceros horn is supposed to have medicinal values. Tiger. Uh, body parts, uh, black bear, and uh, they've had black bear poachers that are kind of common in the in the Appalachians, um, and apparently there's some old, I don't know, Indian folklore about the black bear organs and stuff like that that, that can help you and all those other kind of things. So that's these are way, ways in which. Uh, so you, of course, not only limit them people taking for that, but if you take away their market by uh, not selling that product anymore, that helps to reduce how much their people are going to harvest those animals and plants for it. Um, when a species is in real trouble, there are some things that they can do um, outside of the environment. Uh, these are kind of, this, this particular bullet right here, kind of last ditch efforts a lot of times for particular species. Um, captive breeding is done sometimes. Okay. Pandas are one of the most com uh, famous cases of this. They had it took them a long, long time to get pandas to breed. Um, they even show them videos of other pandas breeding. Uh, I think you can probably uh, draw some parallels to humans doing that. Yeah, exactly. So um, they. Uh, I mean, it was like a news thing. Finally, in the I think it was in the 80s. Mao Mao and Ling Ling or something like that, these two oh, yeah. pandas. Yeah. But, but that was the, yeah, that's what Anchorman, Anchorman was about. <laughs> there you go. Okay, I knew there was a in there somewhere. But that was an actual actual thing. It was an actual news type thing that was going on. I remember when I was a kid. Um, a lot of things do not breed well in captivity. Okay. Um, so captive breeding is is something they'll do, but they, most scientists realize that it, it's probably not going to work very well. First of all, the reproductive rate is low. Second of all, you're taking them out of the natural habitat, so they can't, if there is some habitat, if there's some population there, they're not helping that population out, they're not breeding in the wild, so that's another negative, of course, to that. Um, and also, you know, if you take, if you don't take that many out of the wild, because it's not that many in the first place, those, that, that 
population, <laughs> those ones that you produce are going to be inbred. You know, there's, they're not going to have good genetic variability. So captive breeding is kind of like, all right, you know, it's the last, we'll try this, see what happens from there. Uh, but kind of it's a lot of times you're saying that's, that's an issue. Um, rearing. Uh, this is much more successful. This involves um, once those, the, uh, the animals have mated in, uh, and of course this is only going to apply to animal organisms that lay eggs or to seeds and stuff. Um, if, they, if there's internal gestation, you can't do this. But um, like sea turtles, where as you know, sea turtles are, once they hatch, there's a lot of things they have to do to, and that's natural if, they're, um, if their, their populations were abnormal, then it would be natural for them to have that natural selection. But when they're in, in danger, uh, in trouble, uh, they will uh, raise them, you know, hatch them, raise them, uh, get them to the point where they're strong enough uh, to be out on their own. And they'll take a boat out and, and release them into the water rather than having to make that trip across the sand and stuff like that. And therefore, that helps to increase their their viability and stuff like that. And if you've seen the one with the storks or the, the storks are cranes or something where they follow the the planes, the uh, hang gliders, because they're trying to teach the ones that they've raised. A lot of times, those are efforts. Uh, uh, is a geese? Yeah, it was, uh, it was something in danger though, wasn't it? But yeah, the snow geese. I no, I don't know if snow geese are in danger or not. But anyway, uh, it is. It was an effort to take those that have been uh, captively raised and, and brief, make them better prepared to make it on their own out in uh, society. Um, don't want to inbreed, believe, believe it or not. So what would be the opposite of that? Outbreeding. Out And the case here, any guesses? Panther. Florida panther, right. Now here's the thing with the Florida panther. Um, by the, I think it was the early 90s, the Florida panther populations, native Florida panther populations, it's a subpopulation of the American cougar in general. There are the American lion varieties that they look at, that we see, you see them all through the Americas, uh, South America, et cetera, uh, of this big cat. Uh, and we had a particular subpopulation here in Florida in the Everglades. Um, and they had, the numbers had dropped down to about 30. Uh, they were very inbred at that point. They were, very, they were considered to be genetically extinct. Um, got a lot of, from habitat fragmentation, a lot of them got hit by cars. That was a problem. Uh, so they had a lot of genetic problems, and uh, therefore they made a decision. They had controversy over this, but they made the decision to take the uh, Texas cougar, which was uh, close uh, in both genetics enough to breed well and also was adapted to the same kind of environment. The East Texas environment is very similar to ours. And they brought the Texas cougar in and bred it with the Florida panther, and therefore, you now their population numbers have gone back up in the hundreds. They've got they have them now in Ocala, um, and so their numbers are spreading and stuff. The downside, which I don't particularly, I personally don't really see it, but some people, you know, feel this way. Technically, you're not going to have a, a Florida panther anymore. Yeah. It's going to be bred yeah, out. Different. Yeah, it's it's going to be bred out. Now there, you can look at both of them. You wouldn't know the difference. Yeah. You wouldn't know the difference if you saw them. Don't stand five feet away from one another. Are you? Uh, you know, I think you better you better find some cover, okay? Um, but uh, that's that's an example of what we call outbreeding. And of course, this is only going to is only going to work for subspecies, local types of extinction kind of things. You know, we can't take the California condor and mate it with a vulture and and get you know that's that's a little bit too far. But you may know that you know, you have and also you can't have even hybrids. You may, you know, vultures and condors are very similar. You may actually be able to produce a hybrid, but then that hybrid could not reproduce, like the liger. But um, they're not going to use ligers to, to bring back the tiger populations. But anyway, that's called outbreeding because you're taking genes from outside of the local gene pool and mixing it into them. And that, of course, does add uh, genetic variety. That was the problem. They were inbred. Uh, yeah, I mean, the numbers were low as well. But they, they, as far as them having to recover, they didn't think that they, they they told us that these are genetically extinct, a genetically extinct population, so we have to go from there. Okay. All right, finally, um, if we look back through the fossil records, through the years, you can see the times when there's a lot of fossils, a lot of different uh, species, and then all of a sudden, the numbers of them drop. And of course, you know, hopefully, that you can just look at layers, you know, and see that. They look down through the sediments and stuff, and that is, gives us an indication of time periods. 
So there have been uh, what we call five mass extinction events. The one you're probably most familiar with is what? Dinosaurs. 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 Extinction of the dinosaurs. Yeah, um, about 60 million, 65 million years ago. Triggered by what? Asteroid impact um, from uh, right off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, off the coast of Mexico. Um, it's hard to believe that that's that's not the correct answer. Um, so that's happened. There's actually been bigger ones than that. That was uh, not the big, I think it's maybe the third largest one. Um, but there have been times in the past where, because of these, the number of species on Earth drops between 60 and up to 90 percent in the Permian extinction. That that was the biggest one. 90 um, percent of species on Earth are gone. Okay. Now what happens, fortunately, with the Earth is very resilient. You tend to have a population explosion or a diversity explosion of new species that come in to replace the ones that got killed. But all this takes millions of years, you know. So it's not like, boom, I mean, even with the dinosaurs, it wasn't like the asteroid hit and then all of a sudden they start dying. What happened from there, what, what happened from there? Was it the asteroid hitting that killed them, or what? What happened after that, do you think? Kicked up a lot of dust in the air? Choked and died. Eh, not so much. Climate change. So really, if you want to get down to it, climate change is a major thing that they believe has caused these mass extinctions in the past because something has happened to the planet. Either it was like that from asteroid impact. That's what I think two or three of them are, are believed to be from that. Uh, uh, or uh, extra volcanic activity, excessive amounts of volcanic activity may have triggered some, et cetera, and then a whole bunch of stuff happens from there. Um, the kind of concerning part, or definitely concerning part, is that looking at the rate of extinction, that we are now experiencing, that we can keep track of over the past 200 years or so, there's a lot of people that believe they're actually in a mass extinction period right now. Will you see that? You know, you're going to see it, but you're going to see some things that, that like I said, you may, maybe in your lifetime, the, the hopefully not, but of the um, cheetah might go extinct, or other ones that you've never heard of. I'm sure they will, actually. Um, they have in my lifetime. But, um, you know, we may be triggering this six max extinction event. A lot of people think so. Where you are, the, the thought process. Questions? Anybody?